welcome to Board Game Breakfast. It's the middle of September, and I just got back from Cosmic Con in uh, Minneapolis at the Fantasy Flight Event Center where we played Cosmic Encounter till everyone's faces turned blue. A great time, and there's some cool tweets that I took. If you look at the tweet at the Dice Tower, um, you can see some of the original stuff. I mean, it's 42 years old now, some of this stuff. Really cool. I took some pictures, had a chance to talk to the designers. Um, we did some live recordings of this. You can see us playing. There's some dead space, but I put time marks in those videos. So if you want to go back and watch, I think we recorded five games of Cosmic Encounter live and some interviews with Peter Alaka and Bill Eberly, two of the original designers of Cosmic Encounter and some of the other people involved. And so that's all on the channel channel, you can go back and check that out. If I saw you at the convention, I hope you had a good time, and it was great to see you guys. Uh, don't forget, you can find out all about our website and our show at Dicetower.com. If you click on a donate page there, you can see different uh, prom promos that we have available, including some really cool poker chips um, to see who goes first and stuff like that. Voting. If you go to our website, you can vote in the top 100 games of all time. I'm going to shut this down Wednesday of this week, probably in the morning on Wednesday. So if you're going to vote, you need to vote now. And pretty soon, Sam Z and me will be talking about the People's Choice Top 100 Games of All Times. Okay, it is time to get to the news. Well, there's a lot here to talk about. First of all, from Asmodee, several games that are coming soon. Some of these were shown off at Gen Con, but now are about to hit the market. Abyss will be coming soon. Uh, Dixit, the newest expansion for Dixit. Uh, Timeline Americana. Lords of Zidit. Hy Hyperborea and Colt Express. It's a game that I saw at uh, Gen Con and it's an uh, almost done version where you're some people moving on a train trying to rob the passengers and avoid the sheriff and you're running on a roof and the train is actually like a three-dimensional train. It's a really cool game. I'm very excited about this one. The DSP Awards, which translated as kind of like the People's Choice Awards in Germany. This award is given out at the Essen Spiel Fair, which is coming in three weeks. Um, and they, they were just announced, this is Russian Railroads. You can go online and vote for this. So the best game of the year, according to folks who voted in this poll, is Russian Railroads. Istanbul was the runner-up. And you can check out the website. There, I think they had the top 10 runner-ups. Star Realms has announced some expansions, some booster packs, but they're not boosters where you get random cards. There's going to be, I think, four different boosters. You have bases and battleships, fleets and fortresses, events, and heroes. That's kind of cool because if you only just want to buy one, maybe, like for example, I'd buy bases and battleships first. I want some more ships to throw in my deck, but maybe you want more events, and so that you'll be able to buy these little booster packs. A new board game cafe has opened up in Omaha uh, called Spielbound. I like to announce these on the show because the, I think Board Game Cafe is a cool idea and I hope many of them build up everywhere. Spielbox, it's a magazine about board games, is coming out soon. And this one's going to have an expansion for Sushi Go and Carcassonne half and half. They're diagonal tiles, um, like a triangle tiles. I, how those will fit in is beyond me right now, but that, that's a neat concept. I, who knows, I'll probably still be talking about Carcassonne in 10 years. Uh, we have a picture here, you can see right here, the first picture of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Dice Masters set. And uh, maybe at the end of this week or next week, I'll be showing some more Dice Master stuff. You'll have to wait to see. Two new um, packs for Battle Lore that will increase both the existing factions and add four more units, which is great because as in my review of Battle Lore, I said it has this army build feel to it, so I'm very excited to see this one come in there. Cryptozoic has announced NHL Power Play. This is essentially another one of their deck building games that they're all built on the same system, but this is one I think might work well. I've always thought deck building would work well to build a team, uh, team drafting, and of course they're throwing the NHL license all over this, but it might work well. That's the news. Here we take a look at a shelf and why I keep the games that I keep. 
So we'll start here at the bottom. This is a brand new addition to Battle of Five Armies. I really enjoyed this game. If you saw our top 10 war games past week, I think this is a very solid example. Um, this is uh, very similar to War of the Rings in many ways, but it's less complex and fairly quick. So a great game. Telestrations is a super party game. I'm so glad I have a 12 party player one. This really works well with 12 players. If you just want to have a silly time and laugh and see what happens, then Telestrations is the game to play. Risk Legacy, just last week we spoiled Risk Legacy. We talked all about it on our podcast, but if you've never played it, I mean, I, you notice it's still on my shelf. Even though I've opened everything in the box, I think there's still more exploring to do with this game. Dice Town is a tremendous dice rolling game. The first time I played it, instant hooked on it. Love this game, rolling dice, trying to get poker hands. And For the Crown is a cool little game that mixes chess and deck building. That sounds horrific, but it's actually really good. And I highly recommend that you check this out. This is a great shelf. I love these games. Labor Day weekend marks Snakes and Latte's fourth anniversary. And it has been quite a journey for us over the years. A lot of faces have come and gone. And the cafe itself has become unrecognizable, so much so that people often ask us if we've moved to a new location. Well, we haven't moved, but we have grown twice. The original cafe could hold about 46 people. And uh, after our two renovations, that number has pretty much tripled. In addition to growing and opening a second location, Snakes and Loggers, we're also immensely proud to have inspired numerous board game cafes around the world. We're certainly not the first board game cafe to exist. They've been popular in Asia and parts of Europe for years. But something about the way we did it and when we did it has sparked countless other cafes across the globe, including four right here in Toronto. Interactivity in Victoria, Pizzeria Luca in Vancouver, Meeple's and across the board in Winnipeg, Crowns in Calgary, Tabletop Cafe in the Hexagon in Edmonton, Cafe Randolph in Montreal, Le Revanche in Quebec, Gameopolis in Hamilton, Games on Tap in the Adventurers Guild in Kitchener-Waterloo, Paradise Cafe in Barrie, The Boardroom in Halifax, The Loft, The Odd Spot and Monopoly Latte in Ottawa, Scrabble Latte in Sudbury have all opened since we did in 2010. And that's just here in Canada. The Thirsty Meeple in Oxford, Drafts and Cakes and Ladders in London, Tactics in Godberg, Sweden, The Hungry Hippo in Cafe Marriott in Australia, Night Moves in Boston, Game House in LA, Spielbound in Omaha, The Uncommons in New York City, The Board and Brew in College Park, Maryland, Cosmic Oasis in Richmond, Kentucky, Board Game Island in Galveston, Texas. I could go on, but I won't. Thank you to all of our customers, both the online and fleshy varieties, and of course to the gaming industry luminaries and hopefuls who have crossed our threshold or given us their support over the years. Tom Vassell at the Dice Tower, Tanya Cook, Friedman Fries, the Game Artisans of Canada, Jules and the rest of the team over at Asmo Day, all the local designers, Stephen Sauer, Daryl Andrews, and so forth, who have come to our monthly game designers nights, Lion Rampant, Grossner Sports Cards, and of course, the guys at Cards Against Humanity, a more profitable and uh, wonderful partnership we could not possibly imagine. We thank you for watching our silly videos, and we look forward to being part of the gaming landscape for years to come.
Tom Vassell here. Jason Levine. And special guest. Sam Healy. And today we have a question from Gallen, and he says, when you're playing a board game, basically, and you realize at some point you cannot win, what do you do at that point? Do you attack the leader, trying to bring them down so that you, you know, so that it kind of balances everything out? Or do you go, f uh, do whatever you can to get the highest position place you can get? If I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I will not win. <laughs> uh, no. Um, usually, you know, people say, you know, the real nice people, the people that, you know, like to make everybody happy, they say, you should just try to um, hurt the person that's right in front of you. Like, if you're in fifth place, you should only attack fourth place. No. Thanks, Miss Marple. Big red button. Boom. <laughs> I always attack the person in the lead because you never know if you can eke out that win. And Tom's seen me many times eke out a win where I might look like I'm behind. Um, I would never, ever, ever say, I'm in fifth, I'm going to play for a fourth. I would feel so bad if I was playing for a fourth. But I always play to win. If I can't win, I try to do the best score I could possibly get. And usually, if you're going for the best score, you're usually doing something which attacks people ahead of you anyway. Yeah, the, pro the problem with attacking first place all the time is then you could be labeled a, a kingmaker because you hit number one so much that number two is able to sneak in and grab the win, so everybody looks at you. Only reason two one is because you attack number one, you know? This is what I do. If you... He I look. <laughs> if you look at my pat, we look at the past of the history of the game. And so it comes down between Jason and Sam, and I'm like, Sam, on turn one, I asked you not to attack me, and you did. And that's true. And now it's time for revenge in the game. In a sense, and I don't mean that to be like a vindictive way, but sometimes it's kind of like a, well, I'm going to, I promise retaliation, I might as well pull that off at this point in the game. <laughs> yeah. so, so you changed your opinion, it's not always attack Jason at the end. <laughs> Well, yeah, because you've usually done something in the beginning to, to cause that problem. That's well, true. Yeah, that's that's the thing. If, if, if attacking Jason is anywhere in the mix, <laughs> that's the option to go with. Usually. All right, folks, tell us what you think in the comments below. Also, send us questions at Dicetower at gmail.com. We'll see you guys next time. Adios. <laughs>
Now, my friendly local game shop hosts weekly gaming nights. They have a, a large library of board games you can play. They also encourage people to bring their own games, too. The first time that I attended one of their open gaming events, not wanting to show up empty-handed, I took along my copy of Jamaica. Feeling full of confidence, I proudly entered the game shop, proclaimed that I was there for game night, and that I'd even brought one of my own games to share. Store manager looked at me, and he replied, Jamaica. That's cute. Now, it may not have been meant in a derogatory way at all, but those two words took every gust of wind right out of my sails. I, I might as well have brought Candyland for the way it made me feel. Embarrassed, all I wanted to do was just go home and, and never show my face there again. And that's why, when hosting, we need to remain cognizant of the fact that it probably took a, a lot of effort for those, those new faces at your game group to strike up the courage to even show up in the first place. Their impression of your group and the board gaming and hobby in general may be as fragile as a balloon. It, it's imperative that we warm their welcome because a careless tongue could be more piercing than any pin. We're going to take a look at some dice towers from Raptor. Now, Raptor makes more than dice towers, and I'll be showing all some of the other stuff they make next week. This is their very basic dice towers. All their dice towers come where they're flat, and so they're very easy to put together. This dice tower is okay. It has a cool pirate symbol on it, and I like that, and it's very inexpensive. And probably the next step up from this one is another dice tower. This is kind of flat, although it does stand on its end like this. You'll notice it has kind of a plinko effect to it, so that when you drop some dice in, they roll down the side. Let me try to show you how that looks there. That's pretty neat. I really like that. Now they have a bigger Plinko style dice tower. And this one's made out of plastic and has this really cool um, uh, skull and crossbones on the side. And I really like how this is probably one of my favorite ones utility wise to drop dice in. Just because they bounce around inside that. It's a pretty cool dice tower. Then we have this one here, which is a sort of a, you know, a typical dice tower. You can see here it has some really neat steampunk theming to it. But the way this one works is you can actually take this one apart here. Now let me see if I can figure out which pieces come off this one first. That's right, this one, and then that one, and then that one, and then this one, and this one. And all the pieces fit inside here like this. And then this piece fits on top. Now, let's see. I got to put these pieces in properly. There you go. And the whole thing folds up like that. That's a pretty neat way to have a dice tower, and I'm very impressed. And it does come apart pretty quickly, as you can see. Then we have some mega dice tower. Look at this sucker. That looks just like a dragon. Um, the dice, you can drop them in. Uh, whoops, it's missing a piece here in the back of the dragon. Let's stick that sucker in. You can see all the pieces. They fit in nice and, and smoothly. So I drop the dice in, and they come out the bottom there. And you can even get painted ones. This is what the painted version of the dragon. Now, these are expensive dice towers, but man, tell me this isn't cool. I will keep this one. I like this. And besides the dragon, the other big dice tower is their tower. This is the castle type thing um, where you can, you know, it looks just like, some people call it the church or the cathedral. I like how that one looks, like how it sounds when the dice go down. And this one also has a painted version, which is not really a cathedral here. I guess it's, or else it's the Church of Fire. These are really nice dice towers, and they're not that expensive. Well, the painted ones are. Um, I don't know if they're worth your while, unless you really want to, you could paint them yourself. But I'd say of all of them, I probably like this one the best. I also love how this one folds up. This one's cool and easily portable, and these just are works of art, really neat. So those are from Raptor. Check the comments for a link to where the website is. Hi, Suzanne here. The comments I most often receive are around the perception that I prefer iOS over other platforms. But believe me, as a Windows phone owner, I feel your pain, Android friends. The reality is, iOS just has way more board game apps to offer. So I thought we would take this time to talk through some of the factors that may influence publishers and developers when they're selecting a platform to release their game on. 
With iOS, you have a handful of devices between phone and tablet versions that you need to accommodate, even with the two newly released devices. With Android, you have literally thousands of different hardware and display factors to consider. This creates a base coding and testing quagmire that's exacerbated when you think about the volume of random display and performance bug reports devs will get from their users that they have to handle. Also, the Apple environment is better documented for devs. You have more detailed control with Android, but Apple is basically faster to develop for, in part due to the development ecosystem that's been established longer. Although Apple's screening process is far from perfect, it does create a layer of protection for app developers that Android completely lacks. It's frustrating for devs who can see that their app is in use by thousands of people when only 500 purchases have been made. And it's tough to see dozens of copycat apps released that leech attention and profits away from their product. Yes, Android phones are outselling Apple phones, but Apple tablets still reign. Moreover, app revenue numbers that have been released show that Apple devs are still taking in more income from their product, meaning it's more profitable for them to develop for iOS and Android at this time. Apple is a marketing machine, and this extends to the App Store. Where iTunes is a showroom for apps that promotes apps of all sorts and raises their visibility, Google Play is largely more of a catalog. This makes Apple a better marketing launch point for devs. But without a doubt, the platform competition is amping up, and we're seeing a shift in the iOS-Android first release battle. Star Realms recently released on Android weeks before Apple, and as development tools become more sophisticated and as Android sales continue to grow, I believe we'll see more and more joint platform releases, as with the just-released Ghost Blitz app. This quick segment oversimplifies the myriad of factors board game app creators must take into account, but I hope it helped provide a little insight into the app dev world. This past week at our game time, I was playing games and I took my daughter Melody with me and we got separated. We were playing the same game and then I went and played a game and instead of playing with me, she went and got involved in a game of Munchkin. We have a guy who comes to our game group and plays Munchkin all the time, always has Munchkin ready to go. Now, I'm not a big fan of Munchkin. In fact, I pretty much hate the game. But I looked over and Melody was having a blast. When it was done, I asked her what she thought of it. And she said she really liked it. She wants to know why I didn't have it. She said, I don't think you like it, do you? Um, but I was trying to be as neutral as possible. Because even though I'm not a big fan of Munchkin at all, I think it's great that she is having fun enjoying a game. And I could sit there and say, well, this is an inferior game. But on a, I, I, I can do that in a lighthearted manner, of course. Maybe we are, ah, that game's no good. I can't believe you like that game. But when it comes to molding people or getting people to trash a game they like, I'm always very wary of that. I want to help Melody play great games. But if she plays games that I don't consider to be great and is having fun, why would I want to stop that? It makes no sense. The reason I bring this up is because of the top 10 list we did last week, our top 10 war games. Now you have to understand that when we do our top 10 list, the whole thing is one of frivolity. We like to have fun with each other. People say, you know, you're yelling at each other the whole time. We really have fun doing that. We are not angry or upset with each other. One, at least we can argue very fiercely and as soon as this video turns off, we're having a great time because we're very passionate. But I was very passionate at the beginning towards members of the audience, and I know it came off the wrong way because I got many emails and things about that. And so, first of all, I would like to apologize. If I've offended anybody with that unintentionally, I do not mean to do so. What I was saying in the video was I was talking about the war gamers. I call them grognards because I think anybody who plays play war games is a war gamer. But this is, these are folks who have been playing war games, many of them for many years, and they like very complex war games, um, may often with charts and games that take a long time to play. And I said that they were a dying breed and that you know they were gonna criticize us for our war games and basically to back off. And again, I think I did wrong there in painting that with such a broad brush because my favorite gaming opponent of all times is someone who likes these heavy war games. And I have many friends and many contributors to the Dice Tower, like the Chief and his pals, who like these heavy war games. So I want to be very specific now about what I was talking about there. If I offended you, I would love you to email me and let me know. Maybe we can discuss it through email. And I'm very sorry about that. But at the same time, let me tell you where I'm coming from.
If you look at the comments on that YouTube video or comments on other places, BoardGameGeek or other websites on the internet, you'll see people say things like, how can you guys even talk about war games? You're not experts in that field. You don't know what you're talking about. These are childish games. These are dumb games. These are stupid games with this air of disdain. And folks, for 10, for 30 years now, I've been told that I was a moron for liking games like Axis and Allies and how those weren't real war games. When I was a kid, I got Panzer Blitz and all those games, and I went through them and I was like, oh, okay. And they were fun and interesting, and I played something like Axis and Allies and Fortress of America, and I said, wow, this is so amazing, it's so easy, and gives me the same feeling, and I got excited about it. And there were people who shot me down. And so folks have said to me, um, you're discriminating against a group of gamers, and I don't mean to do that. I think if you sit there and Advanced Squad Leader is your favorite game of all time, and that's all you ever want to play, then good for you. That is fantastic. I have no problem, and I have no problem if you think Advanced Squad Leader is fantastic, and games like Axis and Allies and Fortress America and them are garbage, and you don't like them at all. But what I'm concerned about, and what I will fight against, and I will call people out publicly for it, and I don't care is when you get up there and someone says, I really like Access and Allies, and you say, that's garbage, it's not a real war game, these are real war games. Well, shut up! Come on now, guys. These are the same people, they're like the comic book guy from The Simpsons, and when people come in and they say, oh, I like that, oh, you wouldn't like that, it's garbage. Now, full disclosure, I've been guilty of this. People have come to me and said they like a game, and I was like, you like that game? Oh, there's so many better games. And I was wrong to do that. If someone came to me right now and said Monopoly is my favorite game, then I should be thrilled that they like Monopoly. You say, Vassal, but you know about better games. Yes, these are better games. And in my show and back and forth, I'm gonna tell people they're better games. And when I'm talking to Sam and Z, who are my friends, they're not impressionable people. They're my friends and have strong opinions. We're gonna argue back and forth. And we do in every top 10 list. Ah, oh, that shouldn't be there, that shouldn't be there. But to argue from an air of superiority, especially to people who are getting into the hobby, especially to kids, and say, that's not very good. I can't stand that. And many of these grognards who've done so, many of them have faded off the scene. And that is what I meant by them being a dying breed. Folks who love wargaming and produce it with kids, they are not a dying breed. And I think there is a portion of wargaming that is very alive and well today, but that portion includes these games. That portion includes these lighter war games. And Z got a lot of flack for saying that Small World's a war game, but what does it matter in the long run if he's having fun with it? And so the people who sit there and they hold their ground, they're not just war gamers. There's people who like these heavy Euro gamers and they call these games childish. A very prominent podcaster called me out one time for liking stuff like this and saying, aren't we adults now? It's time to put away childish things. <laughs> Is what we say to them. Who cares? And I want the hobby to grow. And people who stand firm on our games and look down and scorn others for the games they like, I will stand up against it. Now, if I do that on a show, call me out on it. We do it sometimes in a joking way. Like, we'll say, I can't believe anyone likes such a, such a game. And I hope that that's taking in the joking manner that it is. But many times this is not done in a joking manner. And I've dealt with this personally, and it's not just a couple times. I've gone to places before, and the people look at me and ask, and it's like, why are you, what? You think that's a war game? That's silly. And I've done it myself. In fact, I had to apologize about it for several weeks ago because I gotta be careful how people interpret my words. So once again, I, if you are playing these heavy war games and teaching them to your kids, teach them others, that is fantastic. And I think that's great. If you love these games, if Magic the Gathering's the only game you like, if you like Munchkin, that's fantastic. Wonderful. But if you sit there and say that the games you like are the best, all their games are garbage, and the people who play them have no opinion and shouldn't be followed, then boo to you. How are you helping grow the hobby? Oh, I'm going to sit on this show and I'm going to tell you I hate this game and I hate this game. But if you like it, then that's wonderful. I've thrown a few games away because no one should ever play them. But most of the games that I do not like, I hate them. Someone in my game group will want to play them. I will gladly give them that game and let them play that. So 
Hopefully that explains a little bit more what I meant. I'm very passionate about it, but I think I inadvertently offended some people, and I'm really sorry for that because um, those heavier war games and such, those are a blast for those people. They may not be my style. What I'm saying is, though, when you sit on a high horse and say, well, you know, uh, Exodus, Proximus, and Tire, that's not really a war game, and look down and ask it and say, stick with the stuff you know. I'm just going to talk about fun games, and we're going to be charismatic about it. We're going to have loud opinions about it. But folks, and I mean this with the bottom of my heart, when we talk trash about games, we never mean the people who play them. If I don't like a game, let's say I hate um, Flux, okay? I'm not a big Flux person, but I think the people at Looney Labs are doing a great job. I think the games that they produce, people love them, and people who love Flux, that is a fantastic thing. And if my game group, if you want to come and play Flux, you come and play it to your heart's content. I will not turn anyone away because of specific games that they are playing. Bring them all on. But I'm still going to make my top 10 lists. Well, folks, that's it for this week. Like I said, I'm so excited. The top 100 of all time to do that. And it's just, it, it, it's a great time. I'm going to play some games. And we are now in the Essen Spiel Go Zone. Okay, Gen Con is now in the rearview mirror. Although there are still tons of Gen Con games I haven't reviewed yet. I've been reviewing 10 a week and we're just not catching up. But we're trying. And then the Essen flood of games. Even more games come out at Essen than come out at Gen Con. But it's exciting and I look forward to it. Guys. We might even do a live playthrough session this week. So keep an eye on a game that I think will be very exciting to watch, but haven't yet set that up. But, and also, oh, more exciting news, but got to hold off on that for now. Until next time, folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.